It is Monday, March 20th at 5 p.m. And the Board of Commissioners of the Hardwick Electric Department is meeting. Uh, are there any modifications to the agenda? Uh, all commissioners are present, as are Mike and Beth and Sean. Enter line from BEPSA. Are there any modifications to the minutes? The minutes or the agenda? <laughs> I'm sorry. I've been on the phone all day and I don't know if I can still come out with an entire sentence. Are there any modifications to the agenda? Yeah, I'd like to add a very quick executive session just to review some of last week's joint meeting, some pieces I'm not too clear on. And could we also add to the agenda the um, uh, just talking about um, employee compensation? Yeah. So compensation and litigation. Okay. okay. Anything else? Any objection to the changes? Oh, yes. Today? Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. I'm going to want to go over this guy with you all. Do I? Oh, I see trees. <laughs> oh, sorry. That's seaweed. <laughs> <laughs> Did you all get my email with it? Wow, that doesn't come. Yeah, out. yeah, yeah. I, I saw that there was. There, I saw there was one, but I mean, it came in so late. I, yeah. I have not looked at it. Yeah, I just want to walk you through that and get you thinking about it's it. Pretty, it's pretty simple. Then he can just walk yeah. a few lines. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I saw what it is. So that's that's fine. Um, so that's also uh, compensation. For recruiting the linemen. Yeah. Two. We'll just call it employee matter. OK. Um, OK. Any Anything else to the agenda? And all those are at the end. Um, I was sticking them in between financial statements and uh, I, people want to put it after the financial statements or after the wake boat update. Wake boat will take one minute. After the update. Okay. Um, next item is, is approval of the, of the minutes. Um, is there a motion? I move to approve the minutes. Uh, is there second. A second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any nay? Minutes are approved. Okay. Hey, Lynn. Yeah. Um, we. I had. I put either I or somebody dropped off a folder with you with a bunch of minutes that needed. Yes. Signing. And and I signed them and I didn't bring them in. <laughs> okay, can I grab them sometime this week? Uh, I have to find them. Um, I, right. I, I will stop by, and if Beth, if you can print out another set, I'll just sign them again. Okay, perfect. My Thank apologies. you. I walked around with them and then didn't get over when it was <laughs> open, and yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, Sean, purchase power. The floor is yours. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, so since I met with you last month, a couple of things have changed. We've had number one, a capacity auction, which changes capacity prices going into the future. Uh, prices cleared about where we expected. They continue to be very, very low by uh, historical standards. So that's good for Hardwick's cost. Uh, the second thing that's changed is I've updated your budget to include not just that change in capacity, but also the change in energy prices. And then the third thing and last thing is to give you a view into your February budget, but with a specific eye for Mystic Station costs. Those are the costs related to the power plant in Boston that's burning liquefied natural gas under uh, contract to ICE and Wayland for liability purposes. So that's what I had teed up for tonight. Uh, but as always, Field whatever questions you have and as best I can. Um, so let's share screens. May I have that permission, please? Yeah, yeah. Hang on, stand by. Thank you.
There we go. We didn't get this ahead of the meeting, did we? No. We didn't get anything on this? Okay. Yeah, so I think I'll start you with uh, just the PowerPoint slides from the last board meeting. Um, I'll make this bigger so it's easier to see. That's not quite what I expected. And we'll do it this way. Uh, so anyway, I'll show you a picture of prices as I show them to the VEPSA board every month. Uh, we'll focus on Mystic Station costs. And if you're interested, I can talk a little bit about renewable energy credits. Um, <coughs> So first off, the thing to know about natural gas prices on the U.S. continent, on North America, is they've really dropped to their long-term average. We're down below $3 an MMBTU. If you look at a very long-term uh, curve, huh. wow, there we go. So this is a 25-year history of natural gas prices in the United States. You can see we had a very busy start to the 2000s with a lot of price spikes. Then we had a very tame second decade until this past year and a half. So anyway, we're down here, uh, $2.31, and you just draw a straight line under that, and you're hitting all of the troughs from the past 20, 25 years. So that's a signal to buy more power, uh, at least one signal to buy more power. The other signal I wanted to show you is the same graph, but it's showing you liquefied natural gas prices. Uh, this is the price point in the Netherlands. So it's a European gas price. And you can see that price was very low for a very long time. Uh, they don't have a full 25 year history here because LNG hasn't been a thing for that long yet. But in my eyes, you know, low $20 per, per megawatt hour, that is the European metric to measure the energy content of liquefied natural gas. That looks to be the long-term mean, and we're just about twice that right now. We've gone through this huge price spike, and we're down around 40 bucks or 39 bucks as of this afternoon. So we have a little bit more distance to travel, meaning prices should drop a little further before we feel really, really good about buying wintertime power in New England, because I can draw a very simple mathematical equation from this price times the heat rate of a power plant, say Mystic Station in New England, that arrives at what we would pay in dollars per megawatt hour in New England. So mixed signals here. From a continental United States perspective, this is the moment to buy, but still gonna be expensive in New England because liquefied natural gas is still about two times higher than its historical average. Does that make sense? Any questions? Well, the other the other piece in this, though, I mean, that's where that you're when you talk about buying, you're talking about buying for for what period? Yeah, good question. Right now, we are well hedged through 2027. So when I'm talking about buying, my brain goes to the 28 through 32 time period. That's one more five year period. And it gets us to the threshold year of the renewable energy standard, all the current legal requirements cap out and culminate in 2032. So can we go back to the previous slide? I mean, I it look it looks like the the spike that we've had, you know, and it was was kind of a not well it's it's a shorter period, I guess. So it, what's the period that we were picking off on the on the second slide on this slide? This is 25 years, Lynn. No, no, but I but the slide, the next slide, because I would do the flipping myself, but I can't. I'm so sorry, I know. This is in, in, in 2012 or 2010. Yeah. yeah. Okay, now you could now go to the other one. Okay, so 2010 is picking off this long, basically you're picking off that long trough before the spike, before about 20, 2009, 2010. Yep, you got it. You got it. But what makes us I guess in terms of looking out five years from now, I mean, why do we think five years from now is gonna look like the trough area and not like these spikes that are back there? I mean, we don't know how long this trough, because it when we, well, I can't see the years now because you, you've moved. I'm sorry, it. yeah. Um, but it, it, back in 2001, 2002, somewhere in that range, that was a fairly narrow trough. Which is uh, so a great question. Um, so I have a very specific 
purchase in mind here, and I've planted the seed with my boss, Ken Nolan, of course, I would like to extend the Stetson Wind contract for five more years. And I think we talked about this last time, but if we didn't, I'll go over it again. That contract was signed in December of 22 at about $90 a megawatt hour. That same contract today would cost maybe $65. So it's dropped by a third. And so the opportunity that we have is to extend that same wind contract with the same counterparty, Brookfield Renewables, and push it out five more years and then average out the pricing. Lower pricing in the last five years, higher pricing in the first five years. We'll both agree to a handshake that same volume, another five years, and in return, we'll drop that $90 price, you know, all things being equal by maybe 10 or 15 bucks. So you get savings today in return for what may be a little bit more expensive in those last five years of the contract, at least at current market prices. Um, but, but you're also getting a lot closer to your renewable energy standard requirement by committing to that, to that resource. So it's something I've done several times before in my career. We call it blend and extend. Blending meaning blend the prices out, average them by extending the term at a lower price. When 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 you're doing that, is it a, so? Do you? It's a levelized price. Um, close, yeah. We Brookfield has chosen to levelize it subject to a like two percent a year inflation factor. So it's not quite flat, but very nearly so. And I, I forget that. It satisfies the tier two recs, and if so, what's the value? Uh, it satisfies the tier one recs. Tier one. That's the last piece of the puzzle that I have not uh, prepared to show you tonight. Renewable energy credits, Vermont tier ones, have been very expensive this past year. They've been about $10 a megawatt hour. Historically, they've been as little as 25 cents, <laughs> so huge range there. Um, I want to get some market intelligence on what those recs would cost because this is a bundled uh, purchase power agreement that includes both the energy and the recs. And I, I don't have any market intelligence today. I don't know if that rec price has dropped. Uh, and I want to find out. Because if I get those three stars to align, continental natural gas prices drop, that's a green. Um, I would characterize the European liquefied natural gas prices. They've certainly dropped. That's still a yellow. It's not yet down to its long-term mean. And then the renewable energy credit prices, if that was to come into a much lower range, thinking $5 per megawatt hour, just to throw a number out there instead of 10. Uh, when those three things align, I want to be ready to go. I want to and, sign. And the Jones Act goes away. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> be, you'd think that'd be a bipartisan issue in Congress. I'd like to see that go away too. <laughs> John, how much power are we buying from the wind farm? On the Present condition, present contract. Uh, I don't have that memorized, but I can find out for you. Uh, let's see here. There's Stetson Wind. And then we had allocations. Yeah, this isn't very clean. That's coverage ratios. Uh, here we go. So there's the summary up top. So you're allocated, call it roughly 10% in these first two years. And that's three megawatts of the wind project and equals 0.1 times. So it's stated in megawatt hours per year. We're probably budgeting you for about 4,500 megawatt hours per year. And that's just year one. You can see the, the I'm gonna blow this up for you so you can recall what the, you know what, there's an easier way to do this. Let's uh, grab your confirmation statement.
So here's the terms of what we did. This was, uh, there's the nine ten percent There's the about four to 6,000 megawatt hours a year is what we planned for you. And if we extend another five years, we're looking to keep these percentages or to do more? Good question. So I had talked to you last month about doing more if the price was attractive enough. Specifically, we talked about what more meant. Is it 5% more? Is it 10% more? Is it 15% more? And so one of my takeaways from last month was to talk to Ken Nolan because he was at Burlington Electric at the time when they transitioned to 100% renewability in their power supply. And they very deliberately got long. And the question was, well, how, how much extra did they buy? And Ken described that as about a 15% number they bought themselves into over time. So um, I wouldn't want to buy less than this. The easy short-term answer to your question is we're going to match these volumes. We'll keep them the same. So think just over 5,000 megawatt hours a year. Um, but by the metric of Ken's logic, if he wanted to hold that over from Burlington's decisions years ago, uh, you'd buy more. And not just 15% more of this. We're talking 15% of the overall portfolio. Compared right. to the code. So, so, so another 5%. Another 50%. If, it's, if, we're, if we're buying 15% instead of 10%, that's a 50% increase, right? Right. Yep. So I, I, have a, I should understand this, but I... I I'm, I don't necessarily, let's see, this is delivered to the Hardwick uh, Electric Department's uh, distribution substation, or is this at the uh, point of origin in Maine and doesn't include transmission costs? Exactly. This is at the point of origin in Maine, does not include transmission. Um, transmission in New England is a, is, is a posted stamp rate, whether you get power from Northern Maine, Western Vermont, or Southern Rhode Island or Connecticut, it's all the same to ISO and to Hardwick. And is this, since it's Northern Maine, do you have any like, uh, you know, CAI interface issues? Oh, definitely. Yeah. Northern Maine is an export constrained zone. They built a lot of wind up there. And prior to that, they built some gas plants that contributed to the problem. So when I price out power to be delivered in Northern Maine, I look at a long term price history to see how much of a a discount is appropriate based on that congestion. And you can see it in the data, it's very clear. So uh, what do I do mechanically? I take the pricing at the Massachusetts hub because that's the standardized location where all the price quotes come from. And then I do some adjustments, we call it basis adjustments to get it to Northern Maine, in this case at a discount to the Massachusetts hub. That's very okay. important and, the math. And cost to Massachusetts hub is similar to cost to uh, Hardwick Electric, or 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 not? I mean, it, I guess it depends on the route. But well, I I make sh the the way it works out is seller pays that discount, or the seller suffers that discount, if you will. Okay. They know they can't get full market price at the Massachusetts hub unless they were to transport it there. And I elected, we elected to take it at the uh, point of origin, to use your phrase. So uh, the seller. Kind of absorbs that cost. We we pay a discount by taking it at, at that location. So just just to so, so I'm sure because I'm so we're paying eighty six fifty eight delivered. Yep, that's correct. Yeah. Well, it's actually a higher number. I'm giving you the. This was redacted. You might recall we had a eighty six fifty eight, and then by the time things closed, it turned into ninety one eighty four. Right. But yep. Yeah. So that's delivered. That's what shows up in our invoice, quite literally. Just okay. paid it today. So anyway, we're kind of we're getting to some of the issues from last month, kind of ad hoc here. And we've established that under the Ken Nolan administration, if you will, we'll we'll be aiming for our 10-15% length over time when the buying opportunities present themselves. And uh, the short-term opportunity, as I see it forming up this year, is uh, to extend this particular contract five more years at a probably a 30% discount of that 86, 90, 90th dollar per megawatt hour number. Yeah, sorry if you guys already went over this last last week. Oh, no, it's okay. That's great. No, this is this is a twist that Sean went off on to give you what he what he's got brewing in his magic pot. 
but he was here to tell us about January, which was actually a pretty good month overall, 11,000 over budget. Um, and we just got sidetracked, that's all. Yeah, so let me go back to the PowerPoint. So we just went fairly deep on natural gas prices. The next slide that I show the board of directors is power prices. And this is not a 20 year history. This is just showing the bottom of the market as it occurred during the early parts of the pandemic. And we've kind of grown out of that. And this, 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 this area between the blue and the yellow is really interesting. We were expecting a cold winter and a very high priced winter. That did not happen. And the difference in price is about fourfold. We expected $200 pricing, we got 50 thereabouts. So that was the story from January. February was much the same. It was more like a $70 market, but you know, big discount. And going forward, the difference between budget and actuals is just shown by the dotted line versus the solid one. So summertime prices are pretty close to where they've been, but wintertime has come down a lot. Um, I'm not going to show you the January variance number again. That's kind of stale. But the slide I did update since you saw it last week, Mike, is this one. Mystic Station costs came through for the month of February, and it was the most expensive month to date by far. Um, the VEPSA members as a whole had $72,000 in costs from Mystic in January. That ballooned to $300,000 uh, plus. And Hardwick's portion of that grew from about $8,000. And these are unbudgeted costs, unfortunately, to thirty eight. dollars So I have had a call with a subject matter expert at NESCO. This is the New England Committee on energy that kind of represents the six New England states from a regulatory and kind of a load side advocacy perspective. And it was an interesting set of mixed messages. He it was had a front row seat to the negotiations five, six years ago when ISO signed this contract. If you rewind, the story goes like this. Mystic Station wanted to retire. It wasn't profitable. And it told ISO New England as such, I want to retire from the passing market. ISO New England ran its engineering models and said, nope, not safe to operate the grid without you. We're going to require you to stay. And so they negotiated something called a reliability must run contract, RMR for short. And uh, the terms of this deal were set five, six years ago. That was back when LNG was 20 bucks. <laughs> and you know the story from this past year. It turned out very different. And these costs started coming through very Hi. So what happened in January, and to some degree February 2, is Mystic is required to do several things. First, they have to guarantee supply of LNG. Have to, because New England needs to keep the lights on. The second thing they need to do is try and minimize cost to load in procuring that LNG. The frustrating thing is that ISO will not disclose the terms of the details of this arrangement. But from the uh, from Nesco's perspective, the subject matter expert, he really did assure me that the pricing terms were fair. They are being followed. There's an auditor looking over things every single month to make sure they're not just financially accounting for things correctly, but procuring liquefied natural gas appropriately. And so what happened is we had a warm winter and we ended up with excess LNG. And there's only three choices at that point. When you've got too much gas, you either have to turn the ship around and send it somewhere else at a financial loss. You have to sell that gas into the pipeline system, also at a loss, or you got to burn it through the power plant at a loss. And uh, he wasn't aware of which of those three or what combination of things they've done, but suffice it to say, they've lost a lot of money on liquefied natural gas this winter that they bought and could not make economic use of. And we're paying our share of that. Uh, the flip side is a month like September. He emphasized that this contract is symmetrical, meaning if the plant is profitable, the profit flows back to the ratepayers, not to Constellation, who's its owner. So in a month like uh, September, you saw we had a very low cost, like 7,000 bucks. That's lower than their fixed cost of keeping the plant around. So this representative represented um, September as an example where the the plant was profitable, actually, and uh, those pass were passed through appropriate. Those benefits were passed through appropriately to us. Oh, 
So we'll have some more pain. Uh, we've got 18 months to go on this contract. Uh, we're only only a quarter of the way through the term. And so, I would sorry, Sean, I was I was trying to ask a question. I was on mute. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> um, you, you say, I mean, clearly the costs went down, but these are costs. I mean, so we. So what's the benefit? I mean, it's lower costs, but it's not it's we're still paying. We're just paying less. Yeah, the, the benefit at the highest level, Lynn, is is New England is operating on a higher reserve margin and therefore a more yeah. reliable grid. That's the benefit. Yeah, yeah. OK, yeah, yeah. That, that I saw. But I'm, uh, there's no financial benefit to us. Not yet. It could flip the other way in, in concept. It has not done that in reality. Yeah. So where is Mystic Station? Boston Harbor, literally. It's, uh, uh, What's that? So it's, right, it's right by the LNG terminal. Yeah, they're adjacent. Yep. It's hard. <laughs> so I, I've this last column's worth paying attention to. It's very simple math. All I did is say, hey, we've got eight months of actual cost now. What if I average that out and assume it happens that same way on average through the rest of a calendar year or a 12 month period? You might expect $123,000 in total cost over the course of a year. Um, that's a number I'm gonna try and get for you in your rate case when the discovery finally comes around. Um, but it's also a choice at this point in the year to, to stuff it into your budget. So I do have a new budget run. Uh, you know, you had about a $4.1 million budget and change uh, coming into the year, I'll just flash that in front of you. 4.1 was what we gave you back in November. Uh, I Once I update energy prices, which have dropped, once I update capacity prices, which have not shifted much, and then added in Mystic, it, it lands back in the same range. So my recommendation is to actually leave the budget alone. We'll just live with the, the variances as they net out throughout the year. Uh, so how does that, I mean, it, it looks like, you know, low LNG prices means higher costs because they're, they're not, I mean, I, I assume yeah. these are two separate things. So lower LNG prices mean lower um, power purchase, but uh, at least, yeah, I don't know what percentage we'd purchase that would be associated with that lower LNG cost, but does that even out? Uh, and, you know, if, if we continue to have low LNG I, I didn't see if if you had extrapolated there. You know, ba basically, this is a guaranteed. This is a that was a guaranteed contract for cost coverage for Mystic. You know, for the operation. Yeah, I think you're picking up on a on a counterintuitive, but nevertheless factual dynamic here. So I'm going to relay what the subject matter expert at Nesco was telling us. LNG is typically. Well, think about it. LNG is typically purchased in the late summer, early fall at fixed prices for the following year. So under that logic, Mystic Station bought a bunch of LNG at the peak of the market last late summer, fall. So to flash back a picture here, they bought during this spike because that spike existed. And you can see it there in September, August, you know, so they locked in the following year's price and things have subsequently dropped and they're losing terrible money. Those are the costs we're feeling related to Mystic Station. So they had no incentive based on this contract. I mean, they have no incentive necessarily to get low prices, it sounds like. If, if their costs are always covered. Well, the contract is not known, but the subject matter expert on the topic was was assuring me they have every incentive to keep costs low, but it is a simply a feature of procurement. You can't buy LNG supply a month ahead like I do with energy, for example. There's just not enough time to move ships around in that fashion. Instead, it's like contracted on an annualized basis. So they do have the incentive, but thanks to bad timing, they bought at a very high moment in the market. And we're so what does that mean? I'm going to repeat what you said because it was spot on. Low LNG prices equal higher costs. And related to Mystic, that's 100% correct. The flip of that is that lower LNG prices also create an opportunity to buy at lower prices in the future. And that can lower our cost uh, instead. 
and they're essential. Yeah, we can't do without LNG in New England. We're pretty much locked into this for a while. Someday we'll build a big wind project off the coast of, you know, Maine, Massachusetts, Connecticut, and this dynamic will start to soften a little bit. Until that happens, we're stuck with LNG. Gigawatts. How big is how big is Mystic? It's big, Lynn. I think it's. I think it's fifteen hundred megawatts, thank, isn't it? Thank you, Mike. That was what yeah. I was thinking, but it's I didn't big. Have Is that the only spinning resource, or is, or is, or or that's just the main one? No, from a reserve perspective, I'm not. I'm not. I don't have any intelligence on that, Lynn. I'm not clear curious. that it's used for reserves. It's a, yeah. Anyhow, it's a digression. Yeah. It's not anything we can do anything about. Right. Yeah. So really. <laughs> Where I'm at is if I could land you on a question, you know, do you want me to add in $123,000 of estimated costs related to Mystic? I could certainly do that. I would tell you based on what I know today, you're going to land right back in the $4.1 million range because I've also adjusted energy, which has changed tremendously, as you know. So I'd leave it alone. I'll keep writing and disclosing, you know, what I see the variances being. Um, but it is your choice. I'm happy but to. You've adjusted energy you to what cost per kilowatt hour, uh, and that, that's that's what I'm clear. I mean, in terms of the budget implications, because I'm I'm. Yeah, so I'll answer that question with a picture rather than a number. Okay, that's. I budgeted in November at this solid blue line, and as of today, when I refreshed your budget in preparation for this meeting, I'm budgeting the dotted red one. Um. So that's something on the order of the difference between $110 power and $80 power on average, just because the difference here is so huge on average throughout the year. So is, is that a wash then? I mean, as far as... Often it is. Um, if, if everything settled at the exact same price point, it would be a wash. But because we've got supply scattered out throughout New England and demand only in Vermont, it's never perfectly one for one. But Generally speaking, it does wash. But this is your projection of future prices. This isn't. No, this is today's. Well, oh, the, or, I mean, uh, that's what I'm this trying to understand number. is where are the prices coming from? I take them from a broker uh, because they're much more transparent, but they're taking them from the Intercontinental Exchange, which is kind of a proxy for the New York Mercantile, Mercantile Exchange. So they're, their market number is not. Not anything okay. I'm forecasting. I'm just trying to pick up, see which part is. So the year, yeah, I'm just trying to. So which was which was the actual? Oh, I can see which was the actual. Okay. For January, because yeah. our budget is actual. And and this is the price pattern. But what yeah. about the but what about the energy pattern? Are we in our in our budget? Because we don't see the budget on a monthly basis, which I would dearly love to see. Um, unless someone's telling me that we have no seasonality. Um, <laughs> Let's let's get to the last part of the agenda because okay. this is a perfect segue, Lynn. Uh, Twelve one twenty three. I'm going to show you your budget on a monthly basis. Uh, Twelve one twenty three. So in the power bill we send every month, there is this summary. It's got all twelve months of detail in it, um, and you can see here your budget. It's four point one million. I'm going to higher highlight it in yellow because I know this is small. And we're through the month of February now. Uh, this isn't official yet because we haven't sent it in the mail, but I'll be doing variance checks on your February numbers uh, tomorrow morning. And so you can see we had a month in February that was very similar to January in terms of variances. We uh, we had $11,000 variance in January. We're gonna have about 24,000, so three, six percent. Those are low numbers, but power supply standards, <laughs> as you know, we can vary by far more. So anyways, back to your seasonality question. Here is your load. It goes from 3.6 million down to three, bottoms out in May, June around 
1.9, 2.1 million climbs through the summer and then uh, end of the fall. So your peak month is definitely January. It's very seasonal. With December a close second. So, yeah. Global warming will even that up. <laughs> But but I, I guess what I what I don't see and what I can't see here is this is the kilowatt hours. And so the the total above that is 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 the dollars. So it's it's the energy price times those kilowatt hours. Yeah, if I can show you that detail if you'll permit me to flip screens on you one more time. Sure. Um, so here's a tab called the load summary. Um, same number that you just saw, ISO settlement load here. Uh, I got to unprotect. So here's your actual load. Um, if I scroll down, so here's two things. Energy market cost land are just price times volume, megawatt hours times dollars right. per hour, very simple. So here it is on actuals. Same number down here in the budget is shown to you every single uh, month. So on a budgeted basis, we were budgeting $765,000 for January, 657. Then it bottoms out in summer at, you know, less than six figures, believe it or not, <laughs> 89 in May, 108. So yeah, this, this is a feature of how expensive things were. It's partly low, as you just saw, but it's much more sensitive to those crazy $200 prices we were seeing. And so that's the drop in the summer price. Yeah, and yeah. But if we go if we go back to where where the peak was, the peak pricing was was hitting was starting to climb up. What in October? I mean, I I was trying to read this in November, I guess, or December. In other words, the yeah. big delta is really at the end of the year. It's November to March with an emphasis on January, February. That's the that's the spike. Okay, okay. Well, January, February happened. So that's that's real. Yeah. But the, it looks to me like the delta from March, the delta between the orange dotted and the and the green is until you get out to October through October is very small. Yep. And it starts going up in November, but it's still not terribly big. Where it's really big is in January and and somewhat in December. Yep. What what's what's the correlation between you said you got the green from the mercantile Mer, mercantile exchange is that contracts that's based on the number of contracts and and what's the correlation between that and like what actuals are oh i, I call that implied volatility and and the implied volatility in gas and power markets always hovers around 45 50 percent so it's in other words it's completely normal to have a forward price be 50 percent different than a than the actual price turns out to be that that's a frequent occurrence. Well, I just asked that because of the, the reliability of the green curve. Since you said it wasn't based on, on uh, it, it was based on market data. I mean, it was, it was based on the mercantile exchange or something. Both the green and the dotted orange. Both of them yeah. are based on the same thing, aren't they? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so yeah, I guess that would, yeah, since they're, since they're both related to that, I guess that the, it's the it's that the spread, which would be the same. But I I guess my question is 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 that area between the two curves through December? You're saying that winds up being about the same as the hundred and twenty three thousand. Oh, with respect to Mystic, yes, that's that's precisely what I'm saying. Great question. Yep. 
because there's no way to determine that from, from this slide. <laughs> yeah, no, there's a whole lot of spreadsheet stuff going on in the background. Yeah. Um, okay. You're, you're a but, whiz. But, but, this, but this is a more uncertain number than the, than the mystic number because mystic is already locked in. Well, okay. they're locked. Uh, I sure. guess they're locked in until until late summer, when they are they buying for a calendar. What year are they buying for? Yeah, another good question. So the my understanding is they would have been buying, um, in late summer for the subsequent twelve months. So I believe that they are locked in through say July at this point. Because remember, this this whole thing starts in July. So uh, they would have at least bought through June, maybe through August, September. And whether or not that purchase is profitable or not remains to be seen, but given how low things are, I would expect to continue losing money on it. So when you say mystic is certain, uh, yeah, we just don't know. I, I think that but what's certain is what they end up being the, low. What's certain is what they paid for the LNG for the balance right. of the 12 month period. Whereas the other, I'm, I'm, Forgive me, but this is all new information and I'm trying to get my head around sure. it. Because um, we've got to approve a budget at some point. Um, and yeah, I think I think we should be aiming. I, mean, I think we should at least try to approve the budget tonight. And that would suggest to, to do what at the opening, you know, to, to keep the numbers we have. And if we if we're not comfortable with that, we will be pushing it out to get a whole new set of numbers incorporated, built into the budget. And that may not be a worthwhile exercise. What I'm hearing, right? What I'm well, hearing, I I, what I'm hearing Sean say is that we can do a whole lot of busy work and shuffle all the numbers around, recalibrate everything <laughs> around the latest yeah, estimates. We'll be back where we started, and then a month later, we could do it all over again because it's just the nature of the world. And it seems like it should make us a bit uncomfortable rolling into April with no budget approved. It 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 does it does. Um, but I, I was just trying to understand the. It seems to me there's a difference in variability of the projections, yeah. and I'm I'm just trying to. <laughs> Being raw, being too low is a bigger risk for us than being too high. Sure is. It's not yeah, the, as the budget really shows, because we no longer have a big cash reserve in the budget and, itself. And and yep. So that's 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 what I'm struggling with right now on this. Yeah. yeah to me, because, the risk because, question because is it right seems on. To, sorry. Yeah, just because it seems to me that the that the calendar year forecast on mystic costs strikes me as probably being more certain than what the reduction is in projected energy costs based on 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 the futures when we really don't know what's going to happen and as you know you know, we've got two things moving. We've got the weather and we've got, you know, potential volatility that we don't know which way it's going to go or by how much. Yeah. In a normal year, I'd be cheering you on because managing the budget and your cash flow is front and center. But this is a rate case year. I and know. So when I ask myself the question, what's the most important risk management function in a rate case year? I kind of feel like the power budget second now. And I'm really focused on getting after this 123 in the rate case proceeding because I didn't recover that for you. I didn't have this number a few months ago when we filed. So I agree. I agree. That's, well, but that's I thought you were you talking about it. not putting it in, and and that's 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 saying that it's a wash. That if you put that in, that you've got to put in the other piece. No, no, but he's going to take it to. It's it's going to go to the PUC in our next batch of information. Yeah. Without adjusting the energy costs. Yes. That was the piece that I was missing. 
Yeah. <laughs> because I thought he was talking about, do, I thought Sean, you were talking about doing both and that was. Uh, yeah, it's a matter precise, of context. You heard me correctly. For precisely the reason, because it seemed to me that that this is potentially, you know, something that we want the commission to understand um, is is out there as a cost for us. Yeah, you're both right. It's just slight nuances around context. I was speaking about adjusting both energy and mystic with respect to your budget. You heard me right, Lynn. When I have gone through discovery with my last several utilities, and Morrisville is the most recent one. I just did this today for Morrisville's half. The Department of Public Service is very savvy to all this, of course, and they tend to ask me a discovery question. It's like, hey, prices have changed. Please tell me how they compare. And I give them a comparison chart. And then the very next question is, how does that affect your costs? And I go through the same spiel that I started going, I think, with you, Vince. It's normally a one-to-one -one offset. When prices change, you've got a benefit on energy market side. You've got a cost on the resource side because you're not getting paid enough. And it washes out. At the level of a rate case, that's usually as far as the department's taken me. So they have left sleeping dogs lie on price based on that very simple two-step question and my response to it, which leaves me, and they've also done this with, with uh, Washington Electric, not Morrisville so far. Then they ask the Mystic question, hey, we know Mystic Station's a thing. Tell me about those costs. And I end up telling them, well, we didn't have any cost in the rate year because Mystic wasn't a thing at that point, but to date, here's the cost and how we see that. So, yeah. Omitting the uh, lower LNG cost price. Yeah, the departments tend to, to leave me alone on that because it does tend to net out, at least on energy. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, the last benefit that I'll offer to you, I would like to leave your budget alone because one of the more compelling things I try to do is say, hey, VEPSA membership, here's how you all look. And right now, the only outlier in this depiction is Northfield because they run on a fiscal year that splits the calendar year in half. So Northfield always looks different. But everybody else, assuming they adopted the budget at roughly the same time, tends to move in the same direction. And I can offer the board level story more with more congruence and, and less caveats. And so to, to change Hardwick at this point would start to make you look different uh, at this level. And he, this is Sean's perfect world, right? <laughs> you still have to manage your local stuff and I will follow you, of course. But uh, it does help me to keep, keep the utilities as a group kind of on common assumptions if I can. Would it, would it help if we went a few clicks into the budget um, at the level of this? Well, shoot, it's because this is so dated now. We've talked through everything. This was November's reality. Um, you know, if I was to flip over to the current spreadsheet version, you'd still see 4.1 million. It's just gonna- uh, Yeah, it. don't, don't change the song now. Yeah. <laughs> I have kind of an off the wall curiosity question. I'm going to throw it out there. Since Mystic's purchase, the buy in for the LNG was so high. And since it's dropping so low, you know, you're targeting 20 to 30 bucks. I would have to believe there's a clause in whatever contract was written that. It might be worth bailing out of that contract and paying the penalty than staying in it. Yeah, I'm certain that's been discussed. Um, I'm not sure the outcome is much different. You're still going to lose yeah. the money. Just what mechanism you use to, to, to lose it. I, 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 so you I, don't, I, Lynn, I mean, you're, the, you're the contract expert here. Do you think there would, there's a, or would it have to be a bigger spread in the pricing? Uh, first of all, without knowing what what you know specifically is in the contract, but the way the damages would usually work, I, I think Sean is right. Um, it it it's just it's just where you're going to take the hit. But okay. um, the, the it's not it's not going to be the folks selling the LNG. 
no matter how you slice it. Not if they've got a long-term contract for it, no. Yeah, okay. And you think there's no extend an average in that case, as we're trying to do with the wind. Give me five more years of 20 bucks and average it out with the $200 one. I, I don't think people are, yeah, I, I, I don't think people are seeing that. I, I don't know. I mean, I, I've been away from negotiating fuel supply agreements for a few years now, so I don't know what the current practice is, but I would be surprised. I think LNG contracts tend to be shorter than, um, you know, than pipeline contracts. Yeah. Or at least they did. Um, yeah, we'll have more to offer you next month. Uh, the CEO of ICE in New England, this guy named Gordon Van Wiley, is meeting at least at the staff level with the Vermont CEOs in the coming week. Belco is setting that up. And um, so there'll be a little more information trickling out. I don't think it'll be detailed enough to help me as an analyst, but we'll convey that to you when we get it. And, and one of the things that's already come out of that is they're ISO has the power to extend this contract year to year to year as long as they think it serves reliability. But what's already been said by ISO's CEO is, hell no, we're not taking this beating in the public realm again. <laughs> so, you know, this will come to an end uh, 18 months from now. And in fact, we'll get a breather come spring. You know, New England doesn't need LNG through the spring and early summer typically. So I'd be very surprised if they brought, if they had contracted for a ship for April, for instance. That's unlikely and did, didn't you say that uh, uh these contracts are usually up in july yeah so they'd be buying at a much lower price for next year yeah yeah it's super fascinating i could go on and on you know i i listened to both the federal government webinars on this topic energy information administration uh, there's the international energy agency that's helpful uh, but Bloomberg, that's just a source of financial information, has an excellent group of energy analysts, and they put on a, a, a global gas outlook. And it's fascinating to look at because the United States continues to build export capacity. We could very easily be in a situation where we've overbuilt export capacity for the globe, we being the United States. And so we've got this ability to undercut the rest of the globe. So you could see look liquefied natural gas prices being very cheap five years from now because of all this export capacity. But the continental price of gas could be paradoxically very high because we're drawing so much of our resource base for export and not serving domestic customers first. So- Yeah, I'd say to some degree, that's a certainty. Yeah. Yeah. In, in other words, we're gonna be exposed to global pricing where we haven't been on, on nat natural gas. That's the implication of the policy. Turbocharged by Putin. <laughs> Anything else? Sean, so give us. Can you send us the this, this slides? It would be really helpful, at least for me, to, to have these before we meet, like the week before we meet or, you know, sometime so that, because I'd be asking a lot fewer questions if I'd had a chance to sort yeah, of get- I apologize. I'll certainly put them in Mike's inbox and, and maybe Mike, if, if this one is gonna be an ongoing topic, he can kind of put the steps of board slides in there because that's uh, uh, kind of the basic basis for it. But yeah, I'll send them on work. Thank you. And Sean, do we have to make any decisions on Stetson Wind if we want to take more? Not yet. Not, not, not yet. I'm going to write everybody <laughs> a uh, offer letter uh, when we get to the point where we're happy with prices. I've already talked to Brookfield, our counterparty. They're very happy to extend the term and are very open to blending out the price and averaging it as we described. So here you go. I'll make you a Offer letter just like you saw last fall, and we'll talk it through and get formal approvals before we sign. Thank you. Great. Okay. Thanks, Sean. Thank You're you welcome. very much, Sean. Good evening.
That takes us to uh, rate case community outreach. I think okay. Vince, if you want to speak to this, I, 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 you yeah. probably haven't seen what's been going on in the Hardwick Front Porch Forum, although it seems to have stopped. Um, I, I haven't, but I, I, it was going on in Crassberry Front Porch Forum, that, and that's when I emailed Mike. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's the kind of thing where, you know, it's, it's essentially a matter of communication and getting ahead of people's misconceptions. And, you know, maybe it'll fizzle out, maybe it won't, but generally the people that respond or, or write something, uh, they, gen they, you know, I don't know what the PR, PR ratio is, but they represent a lot of opinion and they just happen to be the ones that write it. And, and it's not, you know, it's just getting ahead of it and like, I mean, I don't mind having a, you know, a meeting at the library to answer any questions, uh, if as long as I, you know, get up to speed on all the variables and and how to answer people. Uh, but that type of thing, at least it gives it gives some outlet. It gives some uh, chance for people to either vent or uh, communicate. We should, yeah. It's not for any one of us to be answering. Yeah, questions. yeah, sure. Uh, that's that. I, I think for me, the lesson here is that we are doing a very poor job of communicating with our customers. Um, and I know that there is a public hearing coming up. Um, I know, Mike, that you, you put a link to it ostensibly on, the, on our website. You can't get there. You can't get information about it through that link that I, at least when I tried going through it. Um, you have to sign into EPUC, I think. And, you know, it's, it's a lot more work than somebody should have to make to get to it. But I th it would have been good. We could have stopped the process much earlier if we had been able to give feedback in Front Porch Forum when the stuff started showing up, let alone if we had had, before the DPS does it, before the PUC does it, had had meetings with our customers. And by, I say we, I think it would have been good for some board members to be there, but I think Mike, it, it's a question of you being there um, and take, you know, having a presentation or maybe someone from BEPSA being there and, and answering people's questions then not just putting in a bill insert that people don't know it doesn't really tell them why. Didn't we, didn't we do a uh, announcement in the Hardwick Gazette before that mailer went out that said there was going to be a rate increase? Or am I wrong? I remember. There, there was a there was an article that because it had been said at at, at a at a um, select board meeting, so there was something there. But not everybody reads the Gazette. Not everybody subscribes to the Gazette. If you don't subscribe to the Gazette, you don't get to read it. Right. Front porch, forum, front, front porch forum is free and people do use it as a vehicle for speaking their mind and, and yeah. for raising things. And there were things said, there was a former commission chairman who said some fairly unhelpful things. Um, it, it, anyhow, I, I don't think there's anything we can do about it now. There's going to be a meeting. I haven't seen anything. I don't know whether other people have seen anything in, in their front porch forums, but I think we need to have, we need to be monitoring front porch forum. And I think people need to, you know, Hardwick Electric needs to be a front porch forum member in all the jurisdictions that we serve. So yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah. So that we see them and can respond to them. It's not something that anybody has to spend a lot of time with, uh, but if something pops up, then 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 it can be responded to. If if it needs a response, some of these I think, Mike, you saw the stuff that I sent you. I think it needed a response. Maybe you feel differently. I saw the one you sent me, and I did respond uh, I to think that I sent gentleman. You more than one. Well, I I responded to one. I got one. Yeah. Okay. And then, and I responded to the ones. I responded to the ones that I could that uh, Vince had brought up. I've responded to every customer that I was able to get a contact number or email for. 
Okay. So I think there's only there's only one or two of the what I consider very few comments uh, that I haven't responded to. Yeah, I, I think I mean responses are they're great uh, for dealing with people individually, but they're really reactive rather than proactive. And uh, yeah, the, a lot of the those are communications, the notices, and the you know to some extent front porch forum. Yeah, they're they're one way communications and they're not, you know, they, they don't interactively engage the public. It, it doesn't allow them you know, back and forth. It doesn't, you know, foreign port forum does to some extent, but it's a, it's a, it's a useful but flawed medium for that type of thing. I, I think, I think there are times if we had gone on front porch forum with an explanation of why we were going in, for, you know, it could have been brief, but an explanation, we would have been proactive and we could have done that. In terms of replying, you can reply to the individual or you can reply to the forum. And since we have a good answer, you don't just reply to the individual, you reply to the forum so that they've, everybody who has seen it sees it because there are people who spoke up, but there are other people who are oh, with, the, with, the same, with the same thing. On that, or and I, and it can be used in a positive way. It can be used to when we've had an outage to just send something out and explain what the outage is and how we got it taken care of. And if you still have a problem, please, you know, get in touch with us. Um, there's that, and, and there is not that it's perfect. God knows it's not perfect. Is is Facebook? Um, and there are others, and I know they have more staff than we do, but they use it and. Um, and they use it to good effect. And it, interestingly, uh, a couple of people's comments on the Crasbury Front Porch Forum, uh, Carol Maroney, who's on the VEC board, responded before I did. I mean, I gave you know, a very neutral uh, but objective uh, response, basically itemizing the, what contributed to the cost and that nobody wants it. And that, uh, yeah, in any case, I think I copied everybody on that. But again, I don't think we as individual commissioners should be responding on Front Porch Forum. I, I, uh, I agree with you mostly. I think that this required a response, first of all, that the fact that Carol responded and that um, uh, somebody from Hardwick Electric had to respond. And, you know, to wait, to wait, for, to wait for everyone to get together and agree on some <laughs> type of message. I don't, think, I don't think we had to agree. I think that's something that Mike could have done. Yeah, and, and if you looked at if you look at the response, I okay, I see what you're saying for future purposes. Uh, yeah, but in any case, it needed a response then, and uh, I, I there were no further reactions, so I don't know if that was satisfactory to the person or not. But it did engage, it did lay out the reasons, and um, yeah, you're right. There should it shouldn't be an an ad, an ad hoc process. There needs to be some kind of proactive process for this type of thing. So I, I'm going to go backwards a little bit. I think we discussed this once before about having a PR firm on call that when something's going to happen, we can contact them and say, look, we're about to do this, you know, provide something for us or do it yourself, Help. get a press release out or whatever to say what's going to happen because trying to do it in-house while all the other stuff are happening with a very short staff is difficult to do. I, but I on call is not expensive. And, and the PR firm can send the draft out to everyone you know, for response. I, I don't know if that would, would require a warning or a special meeting, but. I don't think this, I don't think the board has to approve an explanation. We approve the rate increase. I don't, you know, I don't think that, that we, we need to go through, unless there's something that's particularly sensitive about, but, but you know, describing what the rate increase is, we've, we've filed that with the commission. There's probably some description there that can be boiled down and put in plainer language. In, in every rate increase that I ever was involved with, it did, it did that. And, and I, I guess it depends on who the ratepayers see as the face of Hardwick Electric. Do they you know, attribute still, to the ra rating? Come, Vince, it would still come from Hardwick Electric. It's not gonna come from the the PR agency. It's just that someone would do that for right. us rather than, than, than okay. adding yeah, yeah, that yeah. onto the long list of things that Mike and Beth 
If it's your job, you'll do it. If it's not your job, you're gonna do it when you can. Yeah, I, I guess you know, you as a do you do it. Just having right. So the last yeah. time we all discussed this, <clears throat> Mike, you're on track with as I recall it. There was there was no clear we're gonna do this. And I'm still not hearing that from you all right now. I'm waiting for you to say, Mike, we want you to do this. So if that's what you're trying to do, please do it. <laughs> well, we think I you should be able to, uh, do you think we don't need to do this? I mean, I think this is within the ambit of, 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 of managing the utility. No problem, I'll do whatever you guys want, but I'm just the kind of the uh, consensus for lack of a better word, the last time we discussed it was, and I remember saying, I, don't, I wanna under commit and over deliver. And I think I said it wrong when I said it. Um, but you know, if I'm out, like we have a Christmas storm and I'm gone for three days with the guys and this critical front porch forum, uh, message comes up and I am not on front porch forum or Facebook or any of that stuff. I'm no expert, but that would be a three day window of festering that there's no avoiding it in, in my world. Um, so I, my, my concern there was I wouldn't want to get be the guy to hang it up for good reasons but customers certainly don't see those as good reasons you know so Lynn I'd like to make two points sure uh, one I'm not convinced there's a huge problem here I mean I think in this day and age with a, a rate increase it's pretty obvious what the issue is but more information is always good number two um, I made an inquiry the other day about the availability of Maya McCoy. She actually is in New Zealand right now, but she is a daughter of a former, well, I think he, was, he may have been a member of Hardwick Electric's uh, commissioner at one point, Harold McCoy. Uh, and she's very clever and she's a computer person and she does all kinds of things. And I asked her, uh, her husband's mother, uh, if she might be interested in doing this for us. And he, she said yes. So she'll be back from New Zealand in a couple of months. She's very nice. She's very bright and she's computer savvy. And it's a possibility rather than hiring a firm, hiring a person. So when she's back, I'll broach it with her. She is a person though, right? She is a person. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Chat bot. She's a comedian, a juggler. I yeah, I know, who, I know who I know who Maya is. She does she does Vermont vaudeville. Yeah, yeah, she does. She does almost anything. Yeah, she's 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 very talented. I I, I would. I this was not something that I would have thought would have been in her particular bailiwick, but uh, you know we have, to have, we have to have the right person doing it. We I mean and and she you know her, but I think I think you're raising an interesting point. She's sensitive and she's bright and she does computers. That's all I know. That, yeah, well, that's that's, that's, that's right. <laughs> I, I I would leave it to Mike to 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 find the right person, but I think you raised something interesting. Should we have maybe a part time person rather than than hiring a firm, which isn't sort of involved on a more integrated basis? I was thinking of her more on an hourly basis from time to time as needed. Yeah, Again, I, 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 think get, I think we're micromanaging here. I, I think what I'm hearing is that we all want to do, see better communication uh, and, and that it can't all be something that we can expect Mike to be doing all of the time because there are other things, especially when there's an emergency or whatever, which is part of when we need to be getting information right. out so the customers know there's an outage. The Morrisville line was taken out and the whole system's down. Or there's a tree down, you know, there are 20 trees down over Route 14. And people along that corridor are going to be out for the next eight or 10 hours. Um, you know, that kind of, because I can, that kind of thing is important because if people know, so they, they're less concerned. It's like when you're waiting for, you know, your flight's been delayed 
And if you know why it's been delayed, it, even though it doesn't make it less delayed, it's easier to deal with it. Yeah. Well, it's not open ended. It's there not still, yeah. Wondering what the heck is going on. Um, and 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 someone who could deal, who could get that information out on a timely basis, whether it's it's. In, in, in media that people will see or hear, or when there are particular, you know, hopefully we're not gonna have a rate increase all the time, but you know, there will be things, there may be other things that come up. There was the whole Craftsbury situation. There are different things. I think it would be good to have some help with that and to be more proactive. That's, that's, yeah. that's my only point and I and I perfectly happy to leave it to Mike to figure out how to do that it, it, it can it can evolve too I'm sure you know think it can be an opportunity things can come up that you know we haven't even thought of that uh, allow for engagement with ratepayers and you know keep them up to you know whatever it is it could be anything it could be a, a map of outages or it could be a, a new incentive or a, I mean the, we don't have a sign up for mailing list for, because that, that could be part of the scope of work too. Again, I think we're, we're starting to get into the weeds. Sure. <laughs> I get excited so about the, the, I'm all for sharing information. And I, I, you know, I had one the other day when we had a tree come down in that snowstorm and burned down all three phases on the Morrisville side of Wolcott Village. And the guys were down there. There's 10 inches of snow on the road. It hadn't been plowed yet. And they're in the middle of the highway trying to get these wires back up. So I got myself and another guy down there with trucks with lights flashing the slow cars down. <clears throat> and they got the power back on in, in a short order. And on my way back through the village, I stopped at the Wilkett store to get a soda. And their power wasn't on yet. The guys were going to the fuses to close the circuit back in. And they're like, oh, we're closed, blah, blah, blah. We're heading out of here for the day. And I said, oh, your power's going to be on in about five minutes. Relax. So there I'm thinking, okay, if I had done some type of an outreach, there's no cell signal in, in the village. They had no power, so they couldn't have been looking at anything on, on a computer. So my my point is, Absolutely, sharing information is great, but we're going to have where well, there's going to be voids and nooks and crannies in there. It's not going to be perfect. Of what we do. It's, it's not. That, that's all not, I'm saying. It's yep. not going to be perfect. It's not going to be perfect. But you know, there's a whole Vermont alert system, um, and I get notices when you know a road is blocked or something. For some reason, I keep getting Montpelier stuff, but you know, it it. There are systems out there. Anyway, I, 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 we shouldn't let perfect be the enemy of good. So I will do some legwork on this and uh, we can have more discussion about it next month. Okay. The next item on the agenda is um, the pilot payment. Mike, did you want to speak to that or? I think Mike, uh, yeah. So yeah. I I just, um, I'm not sure where, oh, okay, yes. My mind is back on track. So what I wanted to share with you was that the change in costs was indeed traced back to the fact that the town of Hardwick process never updated the valuation numbers on our inventory sheets since 2006. So the state asked their department to run an errors and omissions uh, report on all their accounts. And this one showed up. So Matt, the assessor for the town of Hardwick said, well, there's an error here. 
He didn't explain that error. That's what I had to go back and figure out. But the error was that the numbers were never updated. Even though we gave our inventory sheets every year, which I provided new copies of, but they, we sent them every year. And all Opie and I could conclude was that because there's no tax bill generated from any of this stuff, that nobody really paid much attention to it. And since there was no pilot policy or agreement that was getting updated or evaluated or renewed or canceled or there's just no process, it all just kind of fell in the darkness until, boom, we get this bill for what it should be if we're going to pay based on the tax rate, the full tax rate on our plant and service. Okay. And my question is this. Property tax is not, nor uh, uh, maybe it is on, on commercial property uh, uh, in Vermont. Is, is the property tax on the building and the land? Or does it also apply to equipment in the building? So when we're talking about the town of Hardwick, um, things are askew from every other town that we serve in. Uh, for example, I think I've used Wolcott as an example many times that we have you know, a multi-million dollar facility there, but the town of Wolcott can only charge us the undeveloped value of the land that we own there. Doesn't matter if we had the Taj Mahal, they can't tax us on that. In the town of Hardwick, the pilot taxes us for all our stuff at the full value. But is As it only well. stuff that's attached to the ground? And what you say all our stuff, because you said inventory. Why should right. inventory so, be subject to a property tax? We don't have a all our, property all our, tax in Vermont. All our poles and wires and plant and service are required are considered real property and taxed in every town we serve. Except Wilkett. No, we're taxed there, the, the plant and service there, their poles, wires, transformers, all that, we're taxed at full rate. Oh, I thought you said we're only taxed on the undeveloped value of the land. On lands, correct. But our plant and service, our poles and wires, our distribution system is a different category. And, and so, and, and that applies to other commercial property as well, commercial and industrial property? Owned by private businesses? No, yeah. no, they're different. So where's the authority to tax poles and wires? That comes from the Vermont Department of Stat uh, Taxes and is based on statute. It says you pay property tax the personal property tax rate on poles and wires. Yeah. On the That's on the correct. depreciated value of the poles and wires. Yes, but the depreciated value is much higher than what I would consider or what our depreciated values really are. And that was the last argument I got in with the tax department a couple of years ago where they said, "Well, you know, you you we get to depreciate your stuff 18%." I said, "18%, it should be 60." Or more. I mean, we have poles out there fully depreciated, been fully depreciated, that have plenty of life left in them. They're good. They're serving the customer's needs, but they're not worth anything. They're not worth anything because if we were to sell them, we could only sell them for the depreciated value. That's right. We are only allowed to sell our stuff at book value. And if that's depreciated zero, then it's zero. And these are these are state or federal but, depreciation but, rates. But the towns do the same thing as what as what the pilot does in yes. terms of, uh, of, 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 of a different depreciation rate. Yes, for the plant and service, every town we serve, including Hardwick, is the same. For our uh, properties, is, such as the office building and this property and the warehouse and that property and our other real estate that we have around the town of Hardwick, the pilot charges us the full value, whereas in Wolcott or other towns, we wouldn't pay that. We'd only pay the unde undeveloped value of the land. 
So, so could I make a suggestion just to get something out on the table for discussion? Absolutely. So since we always like to have um, exciting conversations with the town of Hardwick select board, <laughs> I nominate as the next exciting discussion, um, really taking the position that uh, we should we should we should let this pilot program go away, and we should go back to a normal, according to statute, according to the practice with all other towns. Hardwick should be the same as all others. Otherwise, we're shifting costs. We're sort of collecting money from all our ratepayers and then delivering it to the budget of the town of Hartwick. And I'm not sure that's even proper. I'm, beyond being proper, it just doesn't feel right. So I'd offer that up as a possible. I'm not. I'm not minimizing the drama that this could create and all that. But well, it's, it's you know, still they, money to it, the town of Hartwick. It, it, it kind of created drama though with them just coming out of the blue, say, "Sorry, we ignored your stuff for all these years." Kind of like us in some recent situations, but. Uh, the pilot program, my reaction to it, not having been there, is that it's ill-conceived, it's inappropriate. Well, I think, I don't think the town can tax us. That's, that's what gave, no, that's what gave rise yeah. to it. We're part of the town, so that's they right. can't tax us, but they're trying to get the same kind of, what the pilot was intended to do was mm -hmm. to give the town the same kind of benefit that the towns that tax us get. Which, which Hardwick feels, um, use, hearing what we heard at the meeting. But, but uh, did I hear it wrong? Because that wouldn't be an issue for me. I'm just trying to level the playing field. I'm trying to get Hardwick to collecting no less, no more tax from us than any of these other towns. And, and it should be a level playing field. Because our ratepayers hearing... pay, rate live in all these different towns and you know we shouldn't be helping one town's budget more than another town's budget. I, I, I agree with you. Um, I, if I'm hearing what Mike is saying, if I'm understanding, I think I heard it, but I'm not sure I understood it, um, is that, for example, the building where the, where the office is, mm -hmm. if that were in Woolcott, all they could charge us was the undeveloped. They could only tax the undeveloped cost of the land. They couldn't tax the value of the building. If that's Vermont statute, then why doesn't it apply in Hardwick? It's not tax, okay? The pilot isn't tax. The town of Hardwick can't tax itself, okay? So the, this, the idea was, I think, to have a level playing field, but somehow, and maybe it was at one time, who knows? I mean, this thing has been going on for way before any of us were involved in it. But what I also clearly heard when we met with the select board was that there is a feeling at least among some members of the select board that it would be nice for the town of Hardwick to get something by virtue of the fact that, that it has to deal with the electric department in a way that no other town does. You're going like this, but I have a little bit I don't think it should be a but big. But that's difference. so arbitrary. Like, how do you how do you put a dollar figure around that? Yeah, how what cost you, is there associated I mean, with it? Zero. I'm no, not they're, sure. They're, say, I'm they're not saying sure they're not getting anything for it. They're saying they're not. You know that the town doesn't benefit from 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 having to 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 deal with it. They they do. The, they town, the the town does. <laughs> but look, I don't want to get into a big argument about it. I agree that we should be paying on the same basis. That the others do and so it, it is a payment in lieu of tax it shouldn't right. be a payment that generates more than the tax would I'm, uh, we're in the same place we're i'm, I'm yep. with you yeah that sounds perfect otherwise other towns are so i said this last time other towns are subsidizing hardwick uh the town of hardwick yeah i would be careful about that, that because i would i would argue okay I, if i play devil's advocate the town of hardwick would say that they are subsidizing in certain respects, the electric department. They provide police protection for the electric department. They, they provide services to the electric department that the other towns do not provide. There are, so, uh, you know, I, I, I don't wanna. Yeah. 
but yeah, it's it, which is less quantifiable than the amount the the difference between the payment in lieu of taxes, what should actually be paid if it was a level playing field, and that was distributed among the rest of the ratepayers that weren't part of hardware. But I, I agree with you. There are intangible. Well, they're not intangible. They're tangible, but they're less quantifiable. You know, look. Don't even get me started on property taxes because I think <laughs> property taxes are regressive taxes that shouldn't, you know, that that's not how you should be funding municipal services any place or education. But that's, but I, I think we're all on the same page. So, and it's it's already 6.30, so we should be. So just to summarize, my my purpose in having this on the agenda was to circle back with my additional information from the Department of Taxes on the 2006 numbers and to just get you guys thinking and digesting about where you wanna be going into that next meeting. And it sounds like we're all on the same page to me. Yeah, I think we want a new pilot and- um, Basically the way it was. I don't know how it was. I don't wanna talk about the way that it was cause I don't know what it was, but we want we want a new one that, 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 that imposes costs on the electric department the same way that it's done in every other town. And we just don't call it a tax because we can't be taxed. Perfect. The budget. So the budget um, is the same. I mean, <clears throat> the budget for me is nothing near rocket science. We look at it, Beth and I look at it, Jess and I used to look at it. We try and adjust to our, our best of our knowledge what we think the following year is gonna be. And that's how this one started. And since last month, uh, Beth has refined the compensation so that you guys can uh, crack that out of the egg and look at it a little better. The capital budget was modified. I chopped some numbers up and put in actual numbers that I intend to spend this year. For example, the Wolcott Sluice project is a multi-year uh, project. Reality is if we get the uh, bulkhead into the sluice way this year, that's all we'll get done and that'll be a good thing done. So I chopped that project down to just that one piece and, and did so with several others to get us to a real number. Uh, and the third thing that's changed since last month is Beth worked with Roger to get a, a simpler cash flow put together, and uh, I'll let them speak to that. But that's kind of where we went from January till last month till now. Okay. Yeah, the, the comment, Lynn, if it's okay, the, the time I invested with Beth, and she did some, some great work here with Mike, is you know to put together a budget that when you look at the cash flow, Mm -hmm. And I, I draw your attention to that. That's now two pages where, where Lynn does the cash flow. And if you go to the second of the pages that are titled cash flow, I think that's number 27. Yes. The, the key thing that I draw your everybody's attention to is that um, this, the base budgeted capital project, so that column to the left in the capital plan is what she has built in here. And this would mean that we would gobble up 212, almost 200, say $212,000 of our, of our cash balance. And so we would end the year with only $33,000 of cash remaining. Now, remember we have a new line of credit, which provides us with the $200,000 cushion, but this, this is about as tight a cash flow budget as I think in good conscience we could approve. And I'd, I'd be willing to put my vote behind it only because I think in parallel, we're gonna see where the rate case comes in. Is it gonna come in higher than what's budgeted? Only 11% in here. If it comes in at the requested 13, that gives us a little cushion at the end of the year. And we're gonna to have to figure out where we wanna borrow money and which of these projects do we wanna finance? Not just the, call, the ones that are on the right that are contingent on finance, financing, but we're gonna, I think, wanna 
do financing around some of the ones that are in the budget in this cash flow model to create more cushion. So we don't wind up the year. I don't think Mike and Beth really want to wind up the end of the year with thirty-three thousand dollars. <laughs> no. Well, no. yeah. So so if if you're if everybody on the call is willing to sort of proceed on that basis in approving this budget, then I can put my vote behind it. And they did a lot of work to kind of get to something that was at least positive, not negative. I, I, I have some questions on the budget still, um, because I thought we were doing a 11 point something percent. Now, is that budget over budget or is that budget over actual? Because I look at the numbers and I see much smaller things for budget over actual. I mean, for example, just on the first page of the operating budget. Okay. Unless I took my number, put, put them in incorrectly, but looking at it, it can't be. We've got a proposed budget of 4.1 million for purchase power. And, um, and we've got actual purchase power of four, of 4 million. So, I mean, we've got, I, I'm sorry, I'm in the wrong place, but yeah, but the numbers seem a little bit they vary by customer class when I look at the operating revenue. When you say they vary by class, variance to what? What are you comparing? Well, I was looking, again, that's why I'm asking, is it over budget or is it over, at, for example, if I take the proposed budget for, res, you know, for residential against uh -huh. 12 months actual, um, I come up with 11.2%, but then it's 11.7% for seasonal and 13 some percent for commercial and industrial. And maybe it's just rounding error. Well, VEPSA gives us these numbers. I just take this straight from Steve Farman's numbers for revenue. Yeah. And he went with the 11%. So it may not and, be a straight 11% on and each it's one. It's a mixture, and it's a mixture of the, the, both the pricing and the kilowatt hours. I mean, there's a quantity and a price, right? And there's different assumptions around quantity through throughout. So it's not so, just so there are different there are range. different assumptions by customer class on the on the kilowatt hour growth. Okay, and the settlement figure that's agreed. That's what uh, we Sugarman? for Sugarman. Yes. Yeah. We have that's something. All. We have something in writing on that. And they're going to pay all of that this year? No, 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 no. No. Yeah. Same, same repayment uh, structure as the others. Same amount of months that the error was in place to uh, repay the unbilled amounts. How much was the total unbilled amount? Five hundred and five thousand. But this is showing up as the whole amount is in the budget. Yeah. And same way that the auditors I'm had sure. us do. Crassberry Academy. That's I don't understand it, but that's how he says we have. No, to do no, it. But we're not talking about what. How much money do we expect to collect from Sugarman? Because when I look in the, in further back, and I, sorry, I didn't put tabs on. Um, five oh five, and then settlement revenue ended up being four forty eight. What book page is it on? 26 or 23. Okay, so so we we've, we've got 5058 here and we've got 505. I'm not going to worry about the 800 although it would be oh they've got the same number. But yeah. then there was another place where it had there was a note and it had Sugarman and Craftsbury 448. On the cash flow sheet on page 26. Right. The cash flow is what we actually expect to receive from them in revenue this year. So why so why do we so we've got four hundred and forty eight thousand between the two of them. So why are we showing five hundred and five thousand in the budget as revenue? Five hundred and five thousand is revenue that we have earned and per accounting requirements we have to recognize it as revenue because we've already earned it but the cash flow only recognizes the portion that we're actually going to receive this year. So the balance will be next year. But the operating, 
No. It's over the period of the whole. Right. What, so it's like years? 50 grand, 50 grand a year. Right. So we're going to be off 50 grand on the first page. But in the back, you only use the amount we're getting for the year. Right. In right. the cash right. flows, just the amount we're getting this year. We're getting oh. 57,000 in the cash flow. Yes. But the budget is showing us as having a half a million dollars worth of revenue for a fifty thousand dollar item. That's because That's, we're we're doing accrual accounting. Which we're doing we don't, have, we don't have any choice. That's that's accounting. It's, it's can, to me, that's a crazy way to budget. I well, agree 100%. But, but hold, hold it. I mean, I hate accountants and I hate accounting, but account, <laughs> you can't fight with accounting. I mean, it, you, right. it, it's not. That's why the cash flow statement is so important. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You have to accrue. You have to accrue it when, when the. No, I understand. I understand that it, it becomes a receivable. It's a I understand how yes. it would show up Bingo. in a P and L. I understand how it would show in a P and L. I and that I understand. But the, to me, the budget is is something for us to be working from. And 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 that should re reflect real numbers, not. <laughs> not and what, she's not. done that. And she's done that. And that's, that's and that's in and that's in the cash flow. Okay, that's in yep. the cash flow. And and I really I've been through. I mean, Beth had to put up with me going through a million questions and checking everything. And we, it really, okay. it really is right. So 26 and 27 is where you get to cash. Oh, 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 okay, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because there's a bunch of other things too that are, that are non-cash. Well, yeah, the other, the, other, the other piece in here, and maybe, I need to, sorry. Mike and I will say we really need to get this stuff before Friday because I, I had other commitments this week and we could not spend much time on it. Um, so I will forgive me, but I'm, I'm just looking. So in, in the budget, what I wondered about was I mean, it's not a big number. Uh, never mind. It's just not a big number. I, but there's some things that went down that didn't make a whole lot of sense to me on, on lineman salaries and 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 other things. But they, they're small numbers, so I'm not going to worry about them. Lynn, one yeah. thing you had asked for was more detail on the employee compensation, which I included in this. Yes, no, I saw okay. that you did. Thank you. Okay. I haven't had a chance to really go through it, but okay. I saw that it's there. <laughs> Under, I have another question. Under the pilot payment, the 152000 have we actually paid this? No. No, okay. it's due in May. Okay. And how different is that going to be when we do it, when we recalculate that against the way no, other towns are calculated? Yeah. Is it going to be the is, same, higher, or lower? It will be I don't know. It will be lower. A lot. Uh, I'm not going to say that. I just know it will be lower, but I can work out that number. Yeah, probably good to work it out both for your budget, assuming we are able to push it through and knowing what we're up against with the town. Because it's one thing to say, no, it's not going up the way you want it to. It's another thing to say it's actually going down or something. Yeah. Yeah, I can work that up and I'll email you all out that, that information. Um, yeah, not a big, not a big deal. Um, I guess the other stuff that I had was on, on the, on the capital budget. Um, well, I had on the capital budget and on, and, and Roger, you may have been through this, but I have, um, why did health vision and dental go up 44% over actual? The we, we, even though we changed carriers, the price increase was that much this year. Because the prices have not on, on the Vermont exchange did not go up that much. I can tell you that not anywhere near that. 
And also we had some uh, people this coming year that are going to be going on insurance that had not been on it before. Okay. For instance, yeah, it, the number of employees that are on it fluctuated as well. Okay. That, 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 that makes more sense than, than, yeah. than because, because rates well, it, did not go up anywhere as close to that. Yeah. It went right. up about 13, 14%. Yeah, but it was a 44% yeah. increase. Correct. Okay. Yeah, it's because we had a couple uh, employees join the plan that were not participating mm -hmm. previously. Okay, and, and and I'm glad to see, you know, that it went down, but the HRA went down tremendously and I didn't know. So some people decided not to do, not to do it. With our new health plan, the deductible was significantly lower. So we didn't have to fund the HRA as uh, much. It's not a high deductible plan, okay. Is that consistent with the union contract to not have yep. a high deductible plan? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, you, you guys might have talked about this last week, but the difference. Uh, I'm I'm sorry, Vince. I, I couldn't make out what you said, but I was I, well, sorry, I wasn't, sorry I wasn't fi Vince, Vince. I wasn't finished. Oh, sorry. Right. Um, the but going back to the cash flow, which which tracks off of the capital budget. Um, and, and and this relates to some of the stuff going on in the rate case, but something that we've talked about before, which is that capital expenditures, um, at least above some threshold amount, should be funded with 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 borrowed funds rather than being paid out of current revenue. Um, and so, bringing but it looks to me, and maybe I'm, I didn't follow it. That the whole amount was treated as current cash. So to the well, extent, so the, to the extent that we borrow, we would actually reduce the, um, or we would actually increase the amount of cash year end. Yes. <clears throat> which will be vital. Yes, and and which and which again. Um, you know, we, we need to have a policy on this um, and probably a policy on this before the commission is finished with the rate case because it will help us um, in the in the in the rate case for five, from the material that I read in, in in the packet. But the other the other piece here on the capital expenditures was that, and again, this was from looking at it very closely, and not closely, very quickly, was that under hydro transmission. It says annual maintenance. That shouldn't be a capital expense. That should be if it's annual, then it's 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 not a cap. It's not capital budget. Yeah, ten four. The number uh, that hydro, <laughs> excuse me, should be just set the bulkhead thirty five grand. That's the number that got carried through. Uh, the other numbers got chopped out, or and the the. The explanation so, description. So it's there an is issue. Wrong. It's an issue with the description, not the, the description number. is wrong. Yeah. Yeah. Boy, but fix a, that, but that's that, a good. But it's a, it's a it's a hundred thousand dollars is the capital cost for whatever is going to be done for long term stuff at at Wilkett Hydro, not annual maintenance. That's correct. So getting the getting the bulkhead in there with all the dive work and everything we're going to have to do is going to be about a hundred grand. Okay. No, that's that's fine. Good catch. Yeah. You doing the dive work, Mike? Uh, no, they actually go in, you know, with the full body suit and the hard hat on and everything. They've got all these spotlights and uh, they're going to be running an airlift. So they actually go down there with a, a, a specifically custom made device that they shove in the mud and the silt and an air compressor blows air back out the tube up onto the land into a catch zone uh, where all that stuff will go through, filter the water out, water will go back in the river, but we get all the silt and sand out of the way so we can get that gate up and out of there and fix it. Okay. So it's very specialty. They're all you know wired right up. You can talk to the guy while he's doing it, like he's standing there with him. It's pretty cool. No, that was those were those were my questions, and yeah, we need to have way more than thirty three thousand at the end of the year. <laughs> um, 
what, what's the sense, I mean, if we borrowed all of the capital expenditures, and it's sort of hard because they may not be all, first of all, we, if we, we can't do it in one lump because then we need bonding authority, then we need town approval. Yeah. Um, well, I, I'm, depending I'm, upon what we're funding, it may be um, different different tenors. It depends how far we want to take the notion of matching the life of stuff and and the and the and the life of the debt. Borrow payroll. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> no. I'm kidding. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> anyway. Um, yeah, I'm, I would like to see a bigger cushion, but, um, I don't see, I, I didn't see places to, to, to cut. Well, and I, I think a little a cushion, I think a little cushion is just going to come by nature because of the vacancies we have, Lynn, um, you know, they we simply aren't going to be able to tackle project X because we don't have enough bodies to do that. So put it off a year until we get the bodies here, or, you know, we incur a $10,000 a week contract crew charge per crew uh, and add that into the financing, which is an option, you know, it's, it's not, it's really not um, that far fetched and it's not that much more expensive than our own crews. So if it's an important job that we want to get done, uh, I'm going to be suggesting we get contractors. Okay. Um, I don't have anything else. Uh, Vince, you had a question? Or <coughs> oh, I, I'm just curious. What uh, the? Uh, it's not really about a budget approval. I'm just uh, wondering what the extra, the additional cost between 2021, 2022 for VEPSA was for. Is that the GIS project or? It's like a hundred thousand. No, that was, that was, that was a uh, increased in rec costs, Vince, okay. uh, because the tier one recs that are, they were, uh, Sean touched on that. They were going for like 25 and 50 cents a rec, cranked up to $10 a rec. So okay. we, had, we had budgeted buying all these recs to be compliant at 25 cents and they came in at $10, which put us over by about a hundred grand for the year. Well, this, this wasn't an administrative cost. This is a, what, what is that? Does that come under power purchase? No, it's a, the res, all the res requirements, tier one, tier two, tier three, are completely separated out of our purchase power uh, processes and payments with BEPSA. It's a different, they used to include them in the purchase power, but there was no way to separate out and see what one, two, and three were doing. So Ken Nolan and the team there split them out. So they're actually tracked separately. These are 900 accounts. Yeah, it's in administrative in general. Okay. That, that was it. Nice presentation. That was a painful one. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Well, is there a motion? I, I move to approve the budget. Is there a second? I second. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? The budget passes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your hard work on that. Which takes us to the general manager's report. Um, any questions or comments? Remind me again, Mike, about the Richardson stray voltage. Where was that? I was at the Gabby farm with the methane digester. Yeah, that guy from New Hampshire, right? Okay. Yes. So, so, so you said it was a third party complaint. Are, are you talking about a counterclaim or did we bring a separate lawsuit? No, uh, the, the law firm that's representing Hardwick uh, for the Vermont League of Cities and Towns had to get uh, 
the Gebbies themselves brought in as a third party to the, the existing suit. Uh, they were not included in the beginning and there's, we suspect there's reasons for that such, such as the Richardsons already sued them and there may have already been a settlement. Um, and our argument would be, well, you've already been made whole if you already sued okay. somebody for this, it's, yeah, okay. anyway, there's so, twists and so, turns. So they were joined, they were joined to the suit. It wasn't a yes. third complaint. Oh, that, that's what the lawyer called it. I'm not the lawyer, but I'm just repeating what he said. Okay. For lawyers, that's not a third party complaint. And that did confuse me. I was just trying to understand what- Is this the end of that issue? No, definitely not. There'll be a whole new round of discovery now and another, six months of circles before there's more news, I'm sure. Oh, it's a nutty case. Oh, okay. Um, Is everybody aware of that case? Yeah. yeah. I think so, yeah. Okay. Um, just in posting jobs, you, you mentioned the Caledonian record. Again, that's, that's, that's a paper you have to subscribe to. You can't get anything on it unless you subscribe. Um, and I would, also use the News and Citizen, which is a free paper that's distributed in a lot of our service territory. If you're gonna go the newspaper route, I don't know if there are other places. That yeah, the big one that, that um, line workers look to is the NEPA website. They have a big job board there and I have our openings up there. Okay. Is that national, Mike, NEPA? No, it's New England. New England Public Power Association. Mike, if it's not too sensitive, could you describe why Nick LeBlanc was triggered to, to, to leave? By sure. Um, yeah. So uh, I had an exit interview with Nick and when he gave me his notice and he felt um, uncomfortable that Reno left and he was now going to become a leadership position as a head lineman and expected to train junior guys, which is true. Um, he said, well, you know, uh, Reno never taught us how to be a teacher. And he had very, he was very concerned about being responsible for somebody else. And, you know, I said, you're, you're not, going to be tossed out on a limb here you'll be coached through it brian's here you know the foreman of 49 plus years is going to help you and uh he just wasn't comfortable he was really uncomfortable and uh you know he worked with rusty for the last many years and rusty just went to morrisville and he could go reconnect with him and they work well together so off he goes so he went to morrisville yes Thank you. Anyone have any other questions on that? Anything that needs discussing on the um, discovery request? I have to tell you, that is the lightest discovery request I have ever seen. I was pretty psyched. <laughs> In yeah. the rain case. I <laughs> <laughs> orders of magnitude. <laughs> yeah. I used to spend weeks responding to discovery requests. I believe it. Yeah. Foreman says that too. Yeah, they apparently have been inundated with all kinds of stuff, not just multiple rate filings from multiple utilities. So I think there, we That's might tough. be timing this perfect for a for an increased request. But 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 this does raise the issue of a um, a debt finding financing policy. Yes, and I I think that we should have one. Sure. Um, I, I I've I've been saying this you know for a <laughs> long time. When issues of, of long-term investment came up at the town meeting, I said that I thought the town ought to be debt financing and not paying for certain things out of, out of current expenses. Um, I, I feel very strongly about it. I, I think 
you know, we shouldn't be asking current rate payers to pay for something that, you know, will still be providing service five and 10 and 15 and 20 years from now. Um, and I don't know if we want to do a policy now. I would have no problem with that if, if, if someone has a proposal. I mean, we have the advantage of having, you know, a whole range of things. My own view is, is that there should be some threshold. Um, you know, I don't know that we want to go financing every, every five or 10,000 expenditure just because it's going to last a long time. But maybe we aggregate them. Um, and we have to reflect the fact that if it's a larger expense, um, then um, it's board approval. Then it then it requires board approval. Mike, is there? Uh, um, no, it doesn't require a, board approval. It requires the town to approve and the board. Yeah. To is there a policy out there, maybe with one of the other eleven BEPSA members, or even uh, beyond them, one of the larger other utilities like Washington Electric or does anybody have something that we could start with other than a blank sheet of paper? Or does DPS or the yeah. DPC have one? So Steve um, was going to reach out to the, the, count, the numbers guy at the department and ask him if he had kind of a generic one we could start with. Uh, he just reached out for that yesterday. So I don't know that he got it yet or not. So we'll have, I'm sure we'll have something from there. And I'm sure I can get something from a couple other BEPSA members to share with all of us. But right. but if but if we have, without having a policy, we still could have a resolution, which maybe would help. Oh yeah, discover a, a more general resolution. response, a more general thing that that it is the the view of the board, for for example, mm -hmm. that it is appropriate to. Um, fund capital expenditures. I have a motion then for you, Lynn. Okay. I move, I move that Lynn draft a, uh, a, a resolution for us to approve that can be provided. <laughs> <laughs> That's a resolution I was, I was, okay, let me just. <laughs> That's not a resolution. <laughs> um, Give me, give me, give me. But a so, yeah, what's nice about it is it's kind of a guideline that, that shows our direction, but it doesn't bind us. Because I don't think we're ready to be, we're ready to be bound. So, will this resolution make it right this, right this moment or for next month? No, for right now. Gotcha. For, the for, for right now so that we can take up a more specific proposal at the next meeting. Um, okay. Not you know, and if I was to think in business terms, I'd say that, you know, capital spending beyond our, our annual depreciation um, it's, it's our philosophy that capital spending beyond our annual depreciation should be financed. Yeah, and, I, what is and, our annual depreciation? It's about 400, what is it, 462? 400. Yeah, well, then that's not going to leave us much financing. Yeah. No, it sure as hell will. <laughs> the, this year's capital is well, uh, way over a million dollars. No, I'm saying 665. No, no, no. You got to read both columns. I'm reading, but what? What is the additional budgeted capital? Oh, contingent on financing. Yeah. So you got to take both columns and, and then that. Okay. Right. So it's basically 665, 630. So yeah. 1295. Okay. Yeah, so I don't think we want to get, I don't think we want to get that specific no, in, but, in, but, in this. But but it's a that's one possible guy. The other the other particular thing is there's particularly there's there are projects that lend themselves to financing pretty readily, like a bucket truck or a pickup truck or a you yeah. know a, those sorts of assets where the loan secured by the asset and there's 
it's pretty easy to finance it, I think. So that's based on the lifespan of whatever the capital expenditure is for. Anything beyond so many years of life should go to uh, being financed as opposed to out of pocket. Right. So like our, our most recent uh, bucket truck, I bought it and, and we did a 10 year loan on it. <clears throat> I do have a couple of questions that I'll run by Eli um, for feedback based on our present line of credit only requiring HED approvals because it's a revenue bond. And I don't know what the limits are on that or what the ins and outs, but I'll get more details on what that may be for like option A and then the whole town being involved in an option B kind of thing, I'll figure that out. Great. Do you have any relatively new vehicles today that are paid off and we could we could finance them as a way to create cash? That's a little tactical, but if we get in a pinch. Our newest vehicles are uh, 2019 F-250s. And they're paid off. Yeah. Well, hopefully we don't have to, but that might be a source too. I'm not that worried. Good. <laughs> That's like your home equity line of credit. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> I I didn't see see it in the report as uh, Steve Farman. You have any updates on that that wheeling charge, the wheeling rate for uh, no? That's uh, yeah. like that's money that's lost on a daily basis. That's right. As soon as he's done with the rate cases, you'll be jumping on that. Give me one more minute. <laughs> no, thirty seconds. Like the way you did that, Roger. <laughs> well. I think we get great value out of our chairperson because we get these sorts of free legal services thrown in. <laughs> I don't practice Vermont law. But it's a good it's a good thing I don't charge my hourly rate. That's all I can say. We'd be in the hole. <laughs> um throw in that that meeting with the select board, I thought went about as well as it possibly could have. Yeah, we're gonna do that in in in, in executive session. Let's, okay. Um, okay. Okay, this is what I'm not going to make. Okay, uh, give me one. Okay. I move that HED adopt a policy, a debt financing policy at its next regular meeting that reflects the board's philosophy that capital expenditures should be financed in a manner that tries to match the costs incurred by ratepayers with the benefits received by the same ratepayers. Over time. the word timing, if you said over, timing of cost. Yeah, over time. Yeah. Match the timing. Of, with the benefits. Of, of the, the costs timing. incurred. Yeah. The, and the timing of the benefit with the yeah. timing I'll, I'll send you the wording so that 
No, that's great. Timing or life of? No, I don't want to. I'm saying timing because I, I, we may not have. We may not be. We may not. It may not be an exact thing. Yeah. Yeah. Roughly. Yeah. We we. I mean, frankly, typically, we're not getting into a discussion of the motion, but typically, at least based on my experience, lenders want a cushion at the tail. They're not going to. They're not going to give you financing. They're not going to provide debt for the full life of the asset. Right. They're 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 going to do it for some shorter period. That's why I say that tries to match, or that something like you know, or the 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 timing of the of the costs and benefits. Is there a second? Second. <laughs> Any discussion? I mean, I will say that the way this is drafted, if we don't have a proposal for the next board meeting, we're going to have to then do another resolution. But I, I think this this says, you know, we this we're serious about this. We, and this is what our philosophy is, at least. Which we want to turn into a policy. We want to turn into a policy, but but I think we there's some homework that needs to be done on, on that front. Um, is there any further discussion? Hearing none, uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, the motion passes. Um, Beth, I will send you um, an email with the language of the motion. Okay, good. Uh, which takes us now on the agenda to, does anybody have anything else on the financial statements or are we financial statemented out? Out. Um, was there anything in the, in the, um, Bank statements in the in the payment history. Nothing there. People had looked at that. Okay. Which then takes us um, to. Um, I move that we go into executive session to discuss um, an employee matter. Is there a second? Second. So that when the recording goes off, uh, it is 7.08 p.m. now, we will be in executive session. This meeting is being recorded. I don't know what the meeting else is here. It is, it is 7.24 p.m. and we are out of executive session. No action was taken. Okay, uh, Nat, would you please give us an update on wake boats? Good to see you. But around the, to, um, to to get wake boats outlawed on all the smaller lakes. Can't hear you. Out, Matt. Keep cutting out. Well, I don't know what else I could do. If I just speak louder, my. Maybe if you get closer to your microphone. The face here. I'm right in the face. Oh, wh whatever That's you good. Do. Hear me now? No. <laughs> I get a wake boat hacker. Next week, next next month. Hey, when Matt, when, when Matt says he wants to outlaw wake turned. boats on all small lakes, period. <laughs> Was that none on small lakes? On yeah. small lakes. So what's that, does Caspian constitute a small lake or a big lake? Well, where'd he go? <laughs> I don't know. I must think that's what connection. was going on. It must have been his connection. Yeah. Hopefully he'll come back. Okay. Um, well, <clears throat> I will move that we go into executive session to discuss a litigation matter, the premature disclosure of which could prejudice the interests of Hardwick Electric Department. Is there a second? Second. Um, any opposition? 
Hearing none, it is 726 and we are going into executive session as soon as the recording is off. This meeting is being recorded. <laughs> I'll have to get that figured out. <laughs> okay. Um, we are out of executive session at 741 and no action was taken. So uh, the next executive session deals with compensation. Um, and so how do we do this? And then I guess, I guess if we stop, we can stop the recording and then Beth, all that we need to do is get you the time that we um, yep. came back in session and, and um, ended the meeting. Right. Okay. And we can stay on. If you guys get off, we won't, it won't end the whole Mike, maybe make somebody a co host. I, I don't have the foggiest idea. I can make you the co host, Lynn. But that's what you do. Yeah. All right. I haven't got, ah, uh, I'm now the co host. Okay. So I'm at the business office. And as soon as you go into executive session, I'm going to leave. I'm not going to touch this computer, but it won't be recording because I don't know if it'll dump you guys. Or not. I have no idea. If I'm if I'm co-host, it shouldn't it it shouldn't, but that's fine. I can turn this. The I I don't know. I'm not the Zoom expert, so I hate to dislodge all you guys. Right now it says recording, so. Okay. The recording, we should be good. No, I need to, you guys need to go into executive session. I'm gonna yeah, stop to recording so, so, or Lynn can stop recording and then I'll leave. How do I stop recording if I'm- Right at the top of my screen, it says it. Well, it says recording, do I? Yeah, go up there and put your finger on recording. It'll show up pause button. I don't see a pause button. I just I just tapped on it and nothing happened. Yeah. I don't no, know let me do that. let me do this. Yeah. Well, let, let me. Right, we need a motion first. Okay, I move that we go into executive session to discuss a confidential employee matter. Uh, is there a second? Second. Um, I made you the host. Can you do it now? Uh, nope. All right. Well, I'm going to stop it and I'll see y'all later. Okay. All so right. it's 7.43. We're in executive session.